I was in therapy for five years before anyone said the word boundary to me. And the only person that brought it to my attention was a black woman. I had had white therapists before that time. And then I finally was like, I need something else. This is not working. And as soon as I got into her chair, she was like, well, how many boundaries do you have? I was like, what is, what, what, what is this thing that you're talking about? I've been in therapy for this long and have never heard of it. I want to know more from you about, I know your specialty is really in like psychological safety, mental health. Um, but this boundary strategy, I'm like, what is this? I've never heard of this. And I, I me setting boundaries is still a new thing <laughs> in, in personal and professional life. So I would just learn, love to learn more about that and whatever else you want to share and, and tell the masses. Hi, my name is Kay Stroll. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm a psychological safety consultant and boundary strategist. I am 31 years old and I live in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I work in boundary strategy. Like a lot of my work is around boundaries for people that share my lived experiences or my identities because I was in therapy for five years before anyone said the word boundary to me. And the only person that brought it to my attention was a black woman. I had had white therapists before that time. And then I finally was like, I need something else. This is not working. And as soon as I got into her chair, she was like, well, how many boundaries do you have? I was like, what is, what, what, what is this thing that you're talking about? I've been in therapy for this long and have never heard of it. And she's yeah. like, yeah, those, those white people will do that. They choose who is deserving of boundaries and they choose who is deserving of knowledge that is um, crucial to our mental health. Right. Um, and so I just don't want to gatekeep, gatekeep that knowledge anymore. Or I don't want that knowledge to be inaccessible to people like me anymore. So I'm very mm -hmm. specific in what I do so that people have access to at least boundaries. like. That's very level one of the mental health process. Amen to that. So are you typically working with individuals? Are you working with teams, within organizations, with leaders within organizations, all of the above? <laughs> um, it's all of the above. So usually, okay. um, typically I'm giving keynotes or workshops on how to set boundaries at work and how to respect people's boundaries when they are implemented at work. So that conversation mm -hmm. and that um, recalibrating of relationship and the oscillating of like power dynamics that occur when boundaries are brought into the workplace. People have a very wild under, I'm gonna use the word wild for right now, wild understanding of where boundaries should take place. And as we previously stated, who is allowed to set boundaries. Um, sure. So that all mixed up in a, a hierarchy yeah, it doesn't work out well if you don't have somebody meeting, mediating that for you. And I tend mm -hmm. to be the mediator for that. What do you enjoy most about what you're doing? I think the, the thing I enjoy most is the feedback from individuals. Mm -hmm. I would say I do do a lot of free work. And that, I mean, that's on me. But there's a reason that I do the free work is because people need this information and once they get it it is life-changing they start to see how much harm they have been caused in their professional relationships and sometimes even their personal relationships and that's mm -hmm. what does it for me that's why i'm like i just, i have to continue to do this yeah. work even if it's like um detrimental to my savings account I, i'm still going to continue to do this work relatable <laughs> <laughs> you're relatable <laughs> Um, in contrast, what do you enjoy least about the work that you're doing? I think, especially because we live in like a capitalist, uh, white blood, uh, picture society, mm -hmm. um, is having to constantly prove the worth of my work to people mm. who are unwilling to just accept that I have value, like my work has value. Like, right. if I come to your organization, you're, I'm going to add value to the culture there, the relationships there, everything. And just right. having to prove that consistently to people who aren't doing their like own internal work, like 
bringing up mental health to people who, are, who haven't even thought about that mm -hmm. um, is my least favorite part of this work. Yeah, I'm I'm finding that part frustrating too, especially <laughs> with the at least when I'm thinking about the work that I'm doing with like inclusive leadership is really where I'm trying to like pivot my work right now. I'm also trying to lean more into um, helping existing DEI practitioners, professionals, or however they choose to label themselves. I know that's kind of up in the air for people, um, <laughs> but helping people working within that sphere um, design and facilitate effective workshops and discussions. Like that's my, like, I can do that with my eyes closed. I love putting together like workshops. I love the design work. I love facilitating and prepping and all that good stuff. Um, but I find that we're now we're in this, this, this interesting period where people are constantly like, well, what certifications are there? Like, and they want you to, and I'm like, first of all, most of the certifications that exist, cause I've been researching, I should be probably teaching some of them cause that's how long I've been in this work and have been doing it. Um, and for the ones that I could potentially learn something from, the last program I looked at, I think would cost over $12,000. Get somebody else to do it. I'm not, I'd rather invest $12,000 in teaching myself various things, going to YouTube university um, and producing more things where I'm learning as I go, which is, you know, been effective, but it's just so frustrating. And now, you know, people are just putting out certification programs, e-courses, you don't know who's behind it, what experiences they have, but, then you again have people that are like, prove to me why I should bring you in. Um, and that can be really frustrating, especially when you already have, you know, the clientele to prove, or, you know, I looked at your website and I'm like, well, damn, Kate been out here. Like, <laughs> got the clients on deck, okay, right? So it's just, it's frustrating. Um, but, and so I just wanted to just kind of highlight that as well. Um, how do you think that your identities and I say identities plural because I know some folks like to ignore intersectionality, but I don't think that's realistic, but that's not the conversation we're having today. Um, but how do you think your identities impact how you do your work, how you're perceived when it comes to your work and anything else that you think is relevant to that? Um, I think we kind of touched on boundaries, but I think specifically for psychological safety, even when I began to do my own research in it, I was an HR consultant prior to then decided to pivot to a more specific track of psychological safety. And the top two books for that is just old white people who use so who, and they use extreme examples, um, and environments to describe their work. They always use like war zones and they always use like manufacturing warehouses for their examples. And it shows how out of touch they are from what they're talking about. Like it's not in reach for them. Baby, it's in reach for me every day. This is, I am able to touch it every day. I have experiences that are going to be shared in a book once I, ooh, let me just click a book that I'm going to yes. write, trying to be like you, trying to be like yes. you. But um, that will be put in that book, but they cannot do that because one, they came from wealth. Like those people, you're a Harvard professor for a reason, ma'am. Like you, you came from wealth. You had access to that knowledge. It's, right. I'm never going to go to Harvard. Right. But, and that doesn't mean that my knowledge, my experience are less than, but under white supremacy and under the patriarchy, it is concluded as less than. So I yep. think me being honest about my identities and how they've impacted my safety overall and my mental health overall is why I'm so needed in the fields that I'm in mm -hmm. and why more people who share my identities and my lived experiences should be in this field. Amen to that. Um, I, I get so frustrated sometimes with not only the books, but just like even the research studies, because to your point they're just so limited and what they're even studying is just so narrow and i'm like this is a prime example of why diversity matters even from the standpoint of who's researching and writing about it and we don't even talk about that enough i think i called it out some months ago but there was like a report about the current state of dei and i'm like I'm reading through it. I'm like, okay, this is interesting stuff. M much of it, not surprising. Get to the end to see who's contributed. Not a single person that looks like me. 
not a single one. And I'm, that's of course not the end all be all, but it's just when you see the same types of people over and over that are being allotted the space and also the resources because you need money to do this work, it just, it, it really gets frustrating and it can burn you out very quickly. Um, but I'm all for this. I can't wait to see your book and for you to put it out. If I can be a resource for self-publishing, give me a shout. Um, you already are. You do, you do such amazing work it. and all of the information that you put out has helped me so much on my journey. I hope that this makes it. Yes, this part. yes no, I appreciate that. I really do. Um, yeah, I, I really do appreciate that because, you know, one of my goals is also to help more folks that are just aspiring to do this work and, you know, do a little less uh, corporate client work over the next year, if possible, <laughs> would be nice. It would be really nice. If there was someone that approached you that's interested in doing this work, what steps or actions, like tactical actions or steps, would you recommend they take? Um, I think the first steps that I would have told myself a couple years ago when I was like, yeah, I'm going to do psychological safety was to first be very firm in what you will not do and what you will do. So I mm -hmm. don't do a lot of corporate client work unless it's like, um, they already know what psychological safety is and they already sure. like have booked me as a keynote speaker already. So you already know who the fuck I'm about, what the fuck I'm about. And like right. that I'm going to talk about colorism. Like I talk about racism, white supremacy, all of that. And so yeah. just knowing that, see the boundaries, knowing that about yourself as a professional before getting very like specific of, I want to be a psychological safety consultant is mm -hmm. where I would start just being very firm in the work that you want to do. You can have like three different, what's the names in the air, like psychological safety, mental health, uh, black right. people, uh, queer people, trans people. But knowing all of that is so much more important than the title. Mm -hmm. um, and I would have told myself that a couple of years ago because yeah, if I pivot away from this title, that's still gonna be there. Got you, yeah, that's really helpful. I as I look back on the work I've done too over, especially being an entrepreneur over the past three years now, um, I wish I was, I had set more boundaries <laughs> along the way, um, especially early on. But I think early on, I was just like, let me get these clients. Like I need to make this money real quick. <laughs> like, but now I, I definitely have set clear boundaries. If, you know, a client reaches out and they're like, I want to do some analytical data. I'm like, it's, nope, I'm not the person for that. I'm just, nope, <laughs> wrong one. So I, I think that's really important. And I think there's also a level of, um, uh, privilege in a way to being able to set boundaries. Mm. Um, because again, if I'm thinking about money and starting out, there were certain projects that I was like, Oh, I don't, I really don't want to do this, but I looked at my bank account and these bills and I'm like, do I do this or do I start tapping into my savings? And that keeps happening over and over again. So there's constantly, I feel like this balance, um, especially when you're doing this work um, on a consulting basis. I think as I compare it to other consulting work, I'm just like, wow, it, <laughs> it seems like it's just so much easier to do something like, you know, standard business consulting or finance consulting. It's pretty much by the book. But when you're talking about things that have to do with psychological safety, trust, boundaries, the human element, empathy. Mm -hmm. It's just a different animal, especially if you are truly an empathetic person yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's tough. I love that, that you mentioned the privilege. And I think, I mean, even in that word, there's a lot of misconception in that. Like, I think you've talked, spoke to this, like the negative connotation that people add towards privilege. And it's not, right. we're just acknowledging that like, sometimes my bills got to be paid. And even in, in that acknowledgement, you are helping yourself to set um, stronger boundaries because you're saying like, we're gonna do this now, but I know this ain't something I would usually do. And this right. is not something I would prefer to do in the future. So let's take a note of that, but go ahead, sign that check. Thank you so much. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that part, that part. Oh, I love it. Any final words about setting boundaries or things you want to share? Um, I would say that right now as a consultant, as a strategist, I'm pivoting. I'm pivoting mm. a lot and I'm realizing kind of what I spoke to in, in the last, uh, question is that 
my message is still the same regardless of what medium I put it out through, whether it be consulting or coaching or YouTube or LinkedIn or Instagram or TikTok. Right. The messaging is still the same and I am still the same. And being consistent in that is like way more important than um anything else I have touched in my career. Like even if I can't continue to be an entrepreneur, which would be sad. Oh, I'm about to cry. Even if I even if I cannot continue to be an entrepreneur and I have to go back to like the employee employer relationship, I'm still going to carry that with me and I'm going to expect them to allow me to carry that with me in those doors. Yep. Oh, I love that. I love that. I was having a conversation recently with someone where I was like, I feel like I'm just built, spinning a million plates right now. And I've been closer to that point where I'm like, do I start considering a full-time role again or even a part-time role? And I think about it and I'm like, I just, after three years of being in this situation, I feel like I would lose a part of myself in a way to have to go back into that structure that I already know isn't designed for me. Um, I also wonder how difficult it would be for me because I don't really sugarcoat things at this point, especially when I'm talking on YouTube or social, I'm pretty direct and that's not changing. Like if you hire me, what you see today is what you're gonna get. Um, and I, I'm finding the more that time passes as I do this work in the way that I want, the more comfortable I become and the more honest I become, which I'm liking. And I'm, I'm realizing people embrace that when you're just yourself and you're not trying to put on. I, I was looking at a, one of my first videos and like, I was so nervous on camera and I was very polished and I had my script. Now I'm like, boop, turn the camera on. How y'all doing today? Welcome back. Let's get into it. Like I don't do all of that. And it's funny because that's also my facilitation style too now, where it's like, I don't come in with this, like, hello everyone, very polished. I'm like, no, we're going to have a conversation today. I want to keep it real. I want this to feel like you're talking, not necessarily to a friend or family member, but I want it to be a casual conversation that affects change in some way. Um, but I feel like the more you can just embrace who you are and just be comfortable with that, the more widespread your message can be. But I think that may come with consequences if you decide to <laughs> go back into corporate America. So there's always that, you know? So. I hope not. <laughs> I, I, I just hope I don't have to do it, honestly. <laughs> I'm, I'm en I enjoy the variety and I don't know if it's, I think a huge part of it is the fact that I, my ADHD is so severe mm -hmm. that like it kind of gets fueled by mm -hmm. me being able to be like squirrel. Oh, this, oh, that, like, I, I kind of like it. <laughs> like, yeah. I, you know, I love the variety and I love that, you know, I'm not confined to a space and their parameters. Like you can be as creative as you want. I was reading your post, um, earlier about uh the canva images and things like that and i was like oh shit you remind <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, listen i'm like you i don't always have time to hit the likes in the comments but i'm there I'm, I'm always lurking um but yeah i just it just made me think about like you know previous dei roles i'm like i don't think i ever would have been able to like toy around in canva to create things and that's part of you know when you create youtube thumbnails you can play around with things like that so it's just those small things that I personally appreciate in being able to work mm -hmm. in the, you know, all this stuff on, on my own terms. So, yeah. I'm currently reading All About Love by <sighs> Bell, Hooks. Bell Hooks. And one of the things uh, that's said in there is that definition is the crucial starting point for imagination. And on Absolutely Not and Questions Answered and all of my work, I harp on definitions of words because there are just so many people walking around with definitions of words, specifically racism. Mm -hmm. People are just walking around with definitions that they have not taken into consideration that other people may have imagined it differently. Like through my lenses, I imagine racism differently because I have experienced it differently. Right, right. And so, yeah, that, that's just one thing that my work focuses a lot on is just what the fuck are you saying and why are you saying it? Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. I find <laughs> there, I don't know if you've, you kind of follow the whole like DEI workshops and trainings aren't effective. And I'm like, 
that's not true. Mm. It, it, they can be effective. It's about how you deliver them. And I think one of the starting points, in addition to establishing psychological safety, establishing ways of working together and how you're going to interact with people during those conversations is also establishing shared definitions. Because if we come into any kind of workshop or discussion around any of these topics and I'm thinking racism means this and you over here have a different meaning and you have a different meaning, you have, what conversation are we even having? Mm -hmm. Why are we here? <laughs> so I think, you know, it, it seems so elementary in a lot of ways, but you really do have to level set and like have these discussions about what are we even talking about before we can start to try to troubleshoot or come to an understanding with one another, it, which also requires you to be open-minded and to intentionally check yourself to be like, oh, the way that I think about this or perceive this isn't how everyone is. Um, I have to remind myself to do that a lot of times. Things that I'm like, oh, that's common sense. I'm like, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not even for so. like I, I know this is one thing that you and I both agree on is BIPOC and like POC and WOC <laughs> I wrote <laughs> I wrote a blog post on this and I like referenced you hella hard in that because I, I was like <laughs> wild that people did not at, at no point did people like where did this come from where did this acronym that all of a sudden we all just gonna use come from and there's just yeah. no point of origin to it. And I know some white woman was like, this will be cute. Bye, Pop. Just lump them all together. Yeah. <laughs> I'm tired of saying, oh, I'm just gonna. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So um... Just questioning and being critical. Like, people are not doing that enough. And then when Black people do it, specific Black women do it all the time. Like, why the fuck are you saying this? Like, what? Um... And then yeah. people get angry at black women for doing that. But it's just because we are so marginalized that we're like, no, we have to question this because you're going to try to marginalize us some more. And I don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. And even within that, like, I've found that there are so many different opinions amongst black women. Like, and I've, I've really leaned into this on TikTok. I don't know how much you've been on TikTok, but I find that there are a lot of black women on TikTok and that's, it's been really interesting. <laughs> I just say I'm like doing case studies, but sometimes I'll just pose questions just to see like what types of reactions I'll get. It's really, really interesting, like a really interesting study in just like human psychology and how we interact with each other because some people will be like, I don't know why we're even thinking about this. Who cares? Like we have bigger fish to fry. And then there are other people that are like, no, let's not be lumped together with BIPOC. So it's just so, it, it, again, lived experiences mm -hmm. and intersectionalities and all of that good stuff will dictate how we perceive different things. But I can't stand BIPOC. I hate POC. I, <laughs> like, if I hear one more person call an individual diverse, I'm going to scream. Because di diverse is the other, like, I'm talking about a non-white, non-cis-hetero mm -hmm. person. And so I'm just saying diverse. Yes. And I'm just like, because you're uncomfortable saying words like black or mm -hmm. queer or trans or insert whatever it is. And that's your problem <laughs> and not all the folks you decided to erroneously lump together. Um, mm -hmm. So tough conversations to have sometimes, especially knowing how quickly some folks shut down. Um, I've been really leaning heavily into the psychology piece of people like feeling like confrontation mm -hmm. is, is problematic. So, you know, or the fear of having your power and privilege taken mm -hmm. away in some way, which probably won't happen in our lifetime, but here we are. So here we are. there's so many layers, so many one, layers. Uh, one of the brain things that kind of fucked me up recently is somebody um categorize like code switching as the mm -hmm. fawn reaction to trauma um because there's like flight fear oh wait hold on fight flight and fawn and they were like well code switching is a fawn reaction like you're trying mm -hmm. to get white people to like you or you're trying and i was like don't do that do not do that <laughs> please <laughs> look i can't i already am back this i can't do it let's not let's not double back on that one yeah. and i was like that makes so, so much sense and so much of this yeah. is um like i said before like 
information that's so simple that white people make it seem like, oh no, you have to go to Harvard or you won't be able to grasp this knowledge or yeah. you have to get this certification or you won't be able to grasp this knowledge. But the fact that they just broke that down so simple, like code switching is a fun reaction to trauma. I was like, yo. That and that's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. It is. I, I mean, I still find myself code switching. Like I, I had a moment when I reflected on this a couple of weeks ago. And I think for me at this point, it's less so about conforming and trying to be liked. And it's more so about, I'm not about to explain to you or give any recipes away based on how mm. I speak. <laughs> and also depending on who I'm talking to, my language is going to be different. Like if I talk to my family, which is deep in the South, automatically like my accent changes the way i talk to them changes and it's i don't even it's not even a conscious thing but that's just how i speak to them but this conversation i have with you that language won't be the same necessarily or with my friends here in new york where i live it won't be the same so it's like it's not always for white people specifically mm -hmm. as i think about it if that makes any sense <laughs> like, well, that makes sense. it's a very complex thing and i again this now I'm, I'm, I'm connecting the dots here. <laughs> this is why we need more people doing research and that are getting funds to do research because it would be so helpful for us to have more studies um, mm -hmm. and to better understand how we interact with the world, which a lot of it is rooted in trauma. Mm -hmm. And if it weren't our direct trauma, it's generational trauma that's been passed down, unfortunately. So, yay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to do more of these. I love this. <laughs> Any last minute things oh. you want to share, plug, things you want to plug? Oh, I'm doing a lot of writing uh, on Medium, and I'm also doing a lot of writing in the form of workbooks that I'm hoping will help my ADHD kind of like, okay, yes. all we have to do is write like 40 pages, and then at some point we'll put it together and make it yes, into a yes, book. I love but this. But that way I still have like a product and a resource that people can go to while I'm, it'll take, it's going to take me like forever to write a book. It's, it's not. I'm <laughs> <laughs> manifesting this for you. But to be fair, I was like, I'm going to try to write this workbook in like two months. And it took me like five, almost six. So, you know, it might take a little longer than you want it to, but you'll get there. Nice. There, nice. For sure. Yeah. Well, but I will link Kay's info <laughs> below. So go check out the workbooks, the medium post. If you're interested in working with them, be sure to drop a note and I'll see y'all back here soon.